Greetings, programs, and welcome to a special episode of the Awesome Friday Podcast. My name is Matthew, and this week we are sitting down with Seth A. Smith, a Nova Scotian filmmaker whose latest film, Tin Can, debuted last year at Montreal's Fantasia Festival and later the Vancouver International Film Festival, and is now headed to an on-demand release from Level Film. A timely horror film about a world ravaged by a global pandemic In the world of Tin Can, a fungal outbreak is moving like a wildfire through the populace, manifesting growths on people's bodies and changing them into something. In this world lives Frit, a parasitologist played by Anna Hopkins, and just as she is making headway in fighting this infection, she is assaulted and kidnapped and wakes up alone in a claustrophobic suspended animation chamber with no idea how long she may have been there or what state the world might be in. Combining body horror and isolation, this is a dark, damp, creepy vision and a welcome addition to the canon of Canadian horror. Here is a brief clip. What are you saying? Brett. Hey, neighbor. Hey, how long have you been awake? It's been a while now, but please pretend I'm not here. I'm enjoying the show. Are we still at Vase? <laughs> Have you spoken to anyone? Any doctors? <laughs> I need to know what's going on. We are running out of time. Time? After all this, that's what you're worried about? Cheer up. Today is the first day of a brand new life. Not everyone gets to be born twice. Seth and I sat down on Zoom to talk about the film and how it came together. Here is that interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, well, good morning. Thank you for cool. joining me today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, let's uh, just uh, jump straight in, I guess. How has the reception to the film been? It's been a, a kind of a long journey to this point, hasn't it? Like, debuted in, I think, 2020 and coming out in 2022, right? Well, we we actually, yeah, we actually shot it in early uh, 2019, so it's been a while. And we, we shot it, so that was post or pre-COVID, and... Uh, kind of had a weird you know the movie does have some kind of pandemic vibes so we were kind of in this fantasy pandemic and production and in the editing suite for you know a while and then we did the real pandemic so i feel like it's been this gigantic long pandemic of waiting for this movie to come out (laughs) and obviously uh yeah things get delayed with uh you know people not going to theaters and stuff so we're very happy to have it finally coming out and uh yeah, it, it seems to be finding like a, an audience, which I'm very enthused about. You know, you kind of, when as a director, you kind of, you know, you're thinking about your audience because it's a, you know, that kind of format, but you're also making a movie that you want to see. You're hoping that other people want to see it as well. So this was all conceived and shot uh, pre-pandemic. What was the initial sort of inspiration, like the, the spark that where you were like, wanted to make this story? Right, yeah. Uh, well, we did. We had just finished the Crescent at that time, and uh, my co-writing partner Darcy Spidel and I were kind of thinking we'd like to do something more in the sci-fi fantasy realm because uh, the Crescent, you know, although it it is a bit like a you know sci-fi film, it's very much kind of in a, in a real world setting, and so we kind of wanted to just do something that we got to design from the ground up. And we had been playing around with, uh, you know, a single location um, kind of ideas and man in a barrel came up a lot. I was I was kind of inspired myself by factory farming in the context of a horror film. I thought that um, I think I thought it would be kind of interesting and very terrifying to explore, you know, just uh, that kind of industrial uh you know, not just just the the crazy processes that animals go through in 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 that that setting, and apply it to a, a horror film. 
uh, with a person undergoing those things. Uh, we didn't quite go that direction, but it, but that was kind of the jumping off point. And uh, it became what it became. That movie kind of tells you what it wants to be at a certain point. Uh, yep, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, factory farming is the jumping off point. Who who's whose nightmare exactly is this? Is the tin can? Is what I'm curious about. Because it's definitely mine. <laughs> <laughs> Who's nightmare? Uh, yeah. You mean as far as the characters in the film, or either yours or the characters? Like the the, the right. pods, the uh, pods to me are very visceral and, and kind of terrifying. So I'm curious yeah. where they came from. Yeah, I mean, I think they're. It's funny now that we that I, I finished this. Uh, I've been kind of reflecting on the making of it, and I've been. I actually watched The Fly the other night, and I was thinking about, oh yeah, they have pods in there. That's kind of interesting. It's and uh, they have like you know it's. Cronenberg did a lot of body, someone dying slowly of a bizarre disease, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I watched that. That was like one one of the earlier films I watched as a child, and uh, definitely must have crept in there because yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, as a director, you know, you're trying to, you know, put stuff on the screen that, in the context of a horror film, would kind of scare you or make you uneasy and uh and definitely yeah i i actually i kept one of those the, one of the actual vases from the production i have it in my studio and i sit in it sometimes <laughs> now and now it's more of like a like a meditation space or like i can just uh it's almost like if i want some peace and quiet <laughs> i just sit in it <laughs> but uh yeah I think I got used to it because I, I was sitting in it during the production so much I stopped feeling kind of confined by it. And uh, but maybe the actors have the most PTSD from it. Uh, how how big is the like? Obviously, it's big enough for Anna Hopkins to fit into. And then is it like open on one side, or is it like something that you had to like mount a camera into? Or yeah, yeah, they they were three by five. Like we talked about making them smaller and and bigger. You know, it's like. Certain body sizes have to be able to fit in them. Um, uh, Michael Ironside is, uh, you know, a, a bigger person than Anna, and uh, and uh, yeah, we did have to build a bunch of different ones because there were just practical shooting things we had to do. Uh, it it becomes very limited when you're in a space like that, and how many angles you can get, and and. Uh, where you can go with it you know I mean, it's a very small space so we we did have like versions where we'd literally be you know moving around removing walls as we were filming and putting them back it became this kind of elaborate dance every time we shot a scene and uh we had a couple different ones like you know rolling ones waterproof ones and about it was about three or four really and they transformed a lot and you know stole pieces here and there who is, uh, sorry, I don't know the answer to this. I should know the answer to this, but who, the production designer who came up with the pods, like, um, what was their name again? Uh, Matt Likely was our production designer. Yeah. Is there any, um, so the interior of the pod is obviously there's, you know, fluids and tubes and, and such. Was there any specific inspiration for how the inside looked? Well, you know, I, I was kind of with this kind of film, you know, man in a coffin kind of film in mind i had been looking at other fi films that did that like buried and uh kill bill had some scenes like that and i was just thinking of, in terms of you know what, what i'd like to do most of those those uh, films they're kind of you know you have this horizontal layout which really suits the you know the aspect ratio of of the screen obviously but uh, so I wanted to try something a little different, and uh, you know I knew I wanted to get get in very close because it's a confinement story, and uh, yeah, so we decided to go with yeah this vertical structure, and and a lot of the you know little gim you know gimmicky bits and gadgets, and you know a lot of that was just inspired by like how you know how would it work practically. We kind of kind of decided early on we didn't want to do like a typical cryogenic freezing thing where you basically you know turn to ice and <laughs> your blood cracks and everything like that um we were kind of going more with like a suspended hibernation kind of thing so we were thinking about you know how are you fed how do you use the bathroom you know how 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 are you how do you sleep how are you 
stabilized and what's the moisture levels would there be condensation you know things like that how did you connect with um uh well anna hopkins but also michael ironside we we had anna was just uh, i think i saw her on the expanse and uh we we were trying a few people and she was just very enthusiastic about the project and it was really cool because she had a very intense knowledge uh of sci science fiction and uh she was really game to do all the stuff that it required you know when you're, i was pitching this film to people you know you're going to be in like a very you know not wearing a lot of clothes with these tight constraints and you're going to be in yeah this very small space you'll be wet a lot of the time you know it's if we're shooting kind of in a, a warehouse uh, like a dark cool warehouse in the middle of winter and and uh yeah there were a few stunts too and uh like rolling around in this thing while water's pouring everywhere and uh yeah she was very receptive and super game to doing all that and uh and yeah just really kind of uh yeah it was just she kind of inspired me so yeah uh, and that so that worked out well and uh michael ironside he's just you know he's been a hero of mine uh, of, over my childhood like he's always the guy like facing schwarzenegger or he's kind of always a bad guy generally and uh, scanners he's he had one of the best uh fight scenes i've seen in a film it's very, it's all mental at the end <laughs> where they're literally having like a mental face off without touching each other uh, <laughs> i always uh, enjoy that and uh i i called him up and you know i i wasn't it's a, we, we this was a very small film you know budget was and uh i wasn't sure he'd go for it but uh he liked the story a lot and he was pretty game to do it he just had a few like um stipulations he he basically said i'll do it but i have to be killed in a violent way and uh he wanted to be burned alive and i think he wanted to explode or something because <laughs> he's known for all his violent deaths i think he's got like a tally going and he gets his head cut off and i think his arms are cut off in total recall and uh his head blows up in scanners that's right and uh yeah but we settled on that the, the thing i liked about his character is he he was the only character who didn't die he was just you know the a prisoner that's just has a life sentence and just fizzles out in in imprisonment and uh in the end he was cool with it so i thank him for that <laughs> probably the, just... the chillest death scene he has in a film yeah <laughs> Yeah, his his voice lends a lot of gravity to its to its scenes as well, which I I really enjoyed. Oh, cool! Yeah, that is a thing, right? Because because there was a lot of it was almost like a, a, a an audio play where you're not seeing people. So yeah, having a good voice that you know has a good defining characteristic is important. Moving forward in the film a little bit, and not to give too much away, but later in the film, there's obviously these uh, sort of sentry characters as well. What what was the inspiration for the look there? Was there anything specific? Because well, they look awesome, to be clear. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's funny, like when you're writing the script, you're like, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to do this. There's going to be these these people, you know, with synthetic metallic flesh, it's going to work out. It's going to be really something else. <laughs> but then when you get to the, the green light, you're like, okay, I got to make this happen. But uh, I mean, early on, I was, the thing is, I'm very, I was very uh, interested in doing a very primitive kind of medieval uh, vision of future of the future, because uh, I just feel a lot of what you see in sci-fi now is just a lot of tech and gadgets and screens and and holograms and stuff and i just find that today where i'm always on my phone and looking i have three screens going or, at a time sometimes it's it's uh for me the fantasy is is a place that's away from that and so I, w I, I, I was definitely looking at the kind of the dark ages for influence and in, in very, you know, primitive structures are very like, geometric and, and uh, minimal kind of design in that in those terms. And, and uh, even for those guys, you know, we had this, uh, we were kind of exploring the idea of 
the very real idea that you know gold and copper and certain metals have any bacterial properties and so we we're looking at armor and you know how 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 would that work and i didn't want to get too cool about it because i actually kind of like when things are a little clunky and goofy because I, I i think all my movies are kind of comedies they are for me anyway <laughs> so I, I try not to take it too seriously but uh yeah so we, I, I wanted to do something almost like uh like uh armor of a knight in in a sense i kind of drew up a bunch of napkin drawings and uh we had some 3d printers and uh some other designers come in to help actually the guy who designed the the uh, mask was one of the designers for a video game called Destiny. And uh, when I started looking into the stuff, I was like, yeah, I, I kind of want to do some like a futuristic medieval look. And I, I was I realized that oh, Destiny kind of did that a little bit. And uh, so I was like, I'm going to get that. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, again, they look they look awesome. I, I really like when things are clunky as well. So that really works for me. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I get a lot of I, recently I've been getting people comparing it to, to Doctor Who and I actually haven't watched that show. And but uh, yeah, that's I mean, whatever people, however they relate to it's in school for sure. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, there's a definite parallel with the Cybermen there for sure. The So the film is not uh, doesn't have the clearly doesn't have the hugest of budget. Is there anything that that sort of budgetary constraint sort of led to in terms of like a creative like revelation or or something that you're proud of that you sort of figured out with those limitations? Well, when we started writing it, you know, I've you think that you everyone's trying who has a you know low budget in mind. You're trying to keep spaces limited, cast limited, and. Uh, so we we're starting with that in mind to keep things pretty low. I was planning to do it kind of all in my art studio, which is, you know, 25 by 50 room. And uh, I quickly realized, yeah, no, I need more space for that. And uh, so we, we got like a, a warehouse actually where they shot part of the lighthouse here in Halifax. And mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we built these, these, uh, you know, these small stages, these vase stages, but we also had to kind of have the big container room stage and a hall. And, and, uh, so it was, we had a lot of limitations, that's for sure. But it was also like my first time working with sets and, and like I said before, um, kind of creating a world where you, you can't show anything really that, that is a usual thing other than the flashbacks that you, everything that you see on screen has to be kind of invented or made which takes a lot of like art creative work you know by by the by the crew who are super cool um but yeah the the thing that i found that rubbed off on me um was we were in this warehouse that was in it was kind of very industrial and uh and cool and and everyone had their little everyone had their little department you know the costumes would be here there was like this the fitting room and the props were here but it it was we only had a few lights so you know we doing the best we could with our budget obviously but uh it does kind of rub off on you even the actors with their little rooms like you, they kind of felt like they're still in that world even when they're you know off screen so uh did kind of help everybody get in the mood of things i think <laughs> once mm -hmm. we were there and uh i there were a lot of things uh also that we just couldn't shoot there and i i knew that i would be building kind of miniature models with uh, i tend to like with my films you know shoot about 30 percent maybe half the films done shooting at just at my home um with like models or little special effect shots and things like that so um because money was tight yeah there was a little bit more of that uh, afterwards but it was kind of the fun part and probably the reason it took a little longer than usual right um uh, well i don't want to take up too much more of your time but is there anything is there anything about the film that people haven't been asking you about that you kind of wish they would? You know what, I, I wish, like, I don't, I don't uh, really like people to ask me anything about the film. I like talking about it, obviously. But uh, <laughs> I, I like, I have a hard time, expl sometimes people ask, uh, actually I haven't, I'm surprised, I haven't been getting as many story questions or plot questions with this one as usual. 
and uh, I'm I'm actually glad for it because I like when people kind of you know put their own meaning onto th onto things, and I always leave a few parts in the movie um, that hopefully people can take away their own you know meaning or or read it a certain way. And uh, I, I as as we've been going through these different phases of the pandemic from being you know this new thing to being kind of in quarantine to kind of living with the this kind of disease or it's the film itself has taken on a lot of different meanings it's kind of been changing which is interesting so no I, you know my favorite thing is just to talk about uh how we made it because i'm proud of it you know usually mm -hmm. uh i try not to real reveal too much about things because uh you want people to to uh you know still have that that belief in the film as they're watching it but yeah so a lot of people don't realize how much work it takes to make a movie and how many years and you know there's a lot of invisible work so i do mm -hmm. like to talk about that so thank you <laughs> yeah. no problem i mean i didn't ask many plot questions because i feel like going into the story as cold as possible would be a good thing basically. definitely yeah i agree yeah uh, i'm not a, a fan of trailers generally either for that same reason but i like a good trailer now and then, so <laughs> yeah good. Uh, well that's all the questions that i had for you man thank you for taking the time i greatly appreciate it uh, thanks so much for having me matthew i really appreciate it tell you yeah, no, no problem that was Seth A. Smith, the director of Tin Can, which is out now on demand from Level Film. You can find links to buy or rent it on this episode's page, which will be linked in the show notes. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We have more like it planned for the future. And if you have liked what you've heard, please consider giving us a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice. Or to support us more directly, we also have a Patreon and a Ko-fi, which will be linked in the show notes. We record on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations, and this episode was produced by me. Once again, my name is Matthew, and I want to say thanks for joining me on this awesome Friday.